Good morning. Good to see everyone here this morning. I hope we're able to, to benefit from our Bible class hour together. If you're visiting with us, we're uh, delighted to have you here with us this morning worshiping. If you are visiting and not familiar with our meeting times, uh, we just finished up our Bible class hour at 9 o'clock. Uh, about to begin our worship hour here in just a moment at 10. We'll meet again at 5 p.m. for our evening worship tonight and again for our, our midweek Bible study on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. And if you are visiting and don't mind filling out one of the uh, blue cards, should be located on the uh, backs of the pew in front of you. Uh, fill those out so we can have a record of your attendance with us. Pass those towards the center aisles, and we'll have our ushers come down in just a few moments and collect those. And uh, please have a, just a few minutes to stick around this morning. We can have a chance to, to welcome you and make you feel welcome here at Maysville. Um, 680 will be an opening song this morning. If you'd like to use a book, it'll also be on the screen above me. 680 again. <clears throat> Hope you had a chance to pick up a bulletin on your way in. Uh, there were a few notes there. Um, Tracy Broad is still continuing to recover from back surgery and is at home, and um, prayers are still with her. We had uh, a few losses recently, and um, uh, Butch Weaver's father passed away recently. The uh, funeral was this past Monday. Also, um, uh, Jim Bowen and his family, the death of his mother, Emma Bowen, and that funeral was this past uh, Friday in Chattanooga. I do have, um, in our bulletin this morning, we have uh, several cards, uh, thank you cards that have been typed out and uh, sort of published there if you'd like to have a chance to, to read those. Uh, there was one card that didn't make it there that was handed to me this morning. Uh, thank you so much for the cards and food provided to us in the passing of my father. Uh, most of all, thank you for being our friends during our time of need. That was from Butch Weaver and family. <clears throat> Uh, ladies, uh, don't forget about the um, O'Brien's meeting coming up there at O'Brien's restaurant. This will be Monday night at 6 p.m. And uh, for, uh, this is for ladies' night out. There will be a planning session for this coming year. And um, please make plans to be a part of that. Again, that's tomorrow night, Monday at 6 p.m. at O'Brien's. And if you have any questions about that activity or would uh, like to get more involved, uh, you can see Tracy Trailer for details on that. Also, the uh, Tuesday class. Um, this will be a study of the book of Jeremiah. Uh, coffee will be at 9.15 a.m. and then class starting at 9.30. And uh, also after class you'll be going to the, the new Golden Corral, I understand. Uh, so that's uh, the Tuesday Bible study class uh, this coming week. Uh, if any of you would like to sponsor a child uh, from Mololoa in Honduras, one of the main villages that we work with there, um, if you want to sponsor them for school this year, uh, the cost is fifty dollars. Uh, you probably heard of us talk about that before. Um, the schooling is free there, but the the families and children that we support, uh, they do not have the money to actually get the uniforms, supplies to to get to school. Uh, so your fifty dollar contribution is actually what pays for that, and the schooling is free. That actually covers a whole year of schooling. Um, if you have any uh, uh, interest in being a part of that, uh, you can see me or Patty Weaver, and uh, this will make a, a very big difference in their lives there. The money is going to be due by next Sunday, though, January the 11th, uh, so please make plans to act quickly on that if you have interest. Uh, you don't have to give $50. You can give 5 You can give $1. Um, any difference, uh, whatever we can collect, uh, we'll see how many kids we can send to school this year and pay for their uniforms and supplies to get them there. Again, a uh, due date on that will be next Sunday again. <clears throat> there will be no elders and deacons meeting today. Uh, that will be postponed for later. Uh, Last to Leaders Bible Bowl, uh, that is going to be um, for this coming Wednesday. Uh, this coming Wednesday night, you'll meet at 6.30 p.m. Uh, before our uh, 7 p.m. devotional. And um, again, we'll meet next Sunday at 4 p.m. before our 5 p.m. worship. So this coming Wednesday at 6.30 and then next Sunday at 4 p.m. Uh, one other quick announcement. Um, if you have any Christmas cards that are new or used, uh, please give those to Mike Broad. Uh, try to hunt him down, and uh, those can be used for some future projects uh, that we're going to be working on. Uh, again, Christmas cards, new or used. Uh, just see Mike Broad for that. I believe that's all the announcements I have this morning. Uh, let's begin our worship this morning. We'll have our closing prayer uh, at the end by Cecil Philyaw, and uh, let's begin our worship. Pat Bradford will lead us in our opening prayer this morning. Let us pray. Father, we come to you today thanking you for all the blessings that you give us. 
the blessings in being able to assemble together with our brothers and sisters in Christ, the blessings in being able to learn in our Bible classes, and now the time, the time we have to worship together, to sing, sing praises to you and to bring our petitions to you. Father, we ask your special blessings on those that were mentioned today. Bless the bereaved and comfort them, knowing that you are with them at all times. And help us, Father, to be your instruments in this work. And Father, we ask that you bless those who are away from us because of illness. Raise them up, Father, that they might be about your will again. Father, we ask that you bless us in this time together. Help us to raise our voices to you and raise our minds to you and open our hearts to your word. Bless us in all that we do, Father, and always keep us in your care. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We're 680, 680. I'm... Uh, Back today, not full strength, but I uh, had some uh, uh, sinus and other ailments. So uh, anyway, I'm still on medication, so help me out today. 680, we'll sing all three stanzas. <coughs> There's not a friend like the holy Jesus. No. try. I apologize. I don't have it on the overhead today, but we'll correct that next time we do it. And uh, a lot of you probably know it. Hide me away, O oh Lord. And um, if you don't know, it's pretty simple, but the, the guys will start out and sing the lead part, Hide me away, O oh Lord, and then the ladies echo that, Hide me away, O oh Lord. The only times we really sing together is in the middle sections, In the day of trouble, neath the shadow of your wings. We all sing that together and then go back to the men and the ladies on the echo. Hide me away, O Lord, is the first run. Give me your peace, O Lord, safe in your dwelling place. And then finish up with hide me away, O Lord. And we'll sing that through a couple of times right at the end on the refrain. 
Let's give it a try. <clears throat> Hide me away, O oh Lord. opportunity to come to God and to recognize his gift, his precious gift for us, and that is the gift of salvation through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And we partake of his, um, the emblems this morning, the bread and the fruit of the vine is emblematic of the body and the blood of Jesus. <clears throat> and that is a way we worship God this morning, as this song indicates. We sing the second and third stanzas as we prepare our minds for partaking of the Lord's Supper. <clears throat> May we keep it reconciliation. Fathers, we take this bread that represents your son bo son's body. May we remember the things he suffered in his body were what we deserve for our sins. 
and he took our place. In your son's name we pray, amen. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we're so thankful for this cup, what it means to us as Christians. We're thankful for Christ's blood that cleanses us and makes, makes us whole. We know that Jesus paid a debt that he did not owe, and he paid it all. We pray that we, as we take this cup, we may remember him and what he did for us, and take it away as acceptable in your sight. Amen.
Again, we'll sing a verse of 511. We're about to give back to God this morning some of what he's given us. You know, uh, an offering of our lips in song is one thing, an offering of our hearts to God in worship, but offering of our monetary possessions is a good way, again, of expressing our love to God. The children of Israel were required to bring firstling of the flock and uh, the uh, things that they possessed back to God and... Um, the 10 percent uh, rule you know in, in, in thought then but you know our percentages are not what God looks at he looks at our heart and he looks at what our abilities are and it may be more than 10 percent that we're able to do and uh, we need to give back cheerfully and liberally to God's work and uh, we'll do that in just a moment after this first verse <clears throat> oh if we come to before you at this time calling to memory the blessings that you've bestowed upon us how that you've showered down them upon us and provide them for us each and every day we pray Father that we realize these blessings and those blessings especially which include the, the blessings that are in Christ Jesus help us to always be mindful of what you've done for us and we pray, Father, that as we give back, we'll think of what you have done for us and help us to do what we can, that the kingdom might be grown here upon the earth, that its borders might be spread to the sending people out of the gospel. Help us as we give at this time, we ask in Christ's name. Please mark uh, 347 if you'd like to. We'll sing it after the lesson this morning. 347. <clears throat> now we're going to do 531. 531, the first, second, and the last stanzas. And um, y'all been holding out on me a little bit this morning. I can tell you're not really putting it out just yet. So 
Uh, let's kind of rear back and let this one sing out. 531. If you'd like to, please stand. We'll sing this together. One, two, and four. <coughs> Praise the Lord, ye heavens adore him. Praise him. Welcome to Maysville. We are glad to have you here, beginning of new year, and hope it is going to be a good year for you. We look forward to the opportunity, every service, the gathering with our brothers and sisters in Christ. This morning is no exception. If you're visiting with us, we're glad you've come to be with us. Started off the new year here with us this morning. We hope we'll see you again. If you're living in our community, we hope we'll see you regularly. We'd love to meet you and welcome you to our services this morning. If there's anything we can do for you, we hope that you will let us know. And uh, stay around long enough for us to get to meet you before you get away this morning. I want to start our discussion this morning with a question. Do you have any enemies? Would you need a list? Would it need to be a long piece of paper? Or would you struggle? The Lord did. He had enemies and he assumed that we would as well. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. You have heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use and persecute you. I'm going to go out on a limb here, but I'm guessing that most of us would rather not have enemies. We would like people to like us. We want to be able to get along with those that we're around in life. And when Jesus says, love your enemies, he doesn't mean uh, to love those whom you hate. He's describing those who are going to be opposed to us. So that leads us to some other questions when we have a statement made like Jesus did. Who would hate Jesus? What would be wrong with a person who would hate the Son of God, who would despise or do anything against the person that we know is Jesus Christ. There are several passages I want for us to notice this morning. Acts chapter 10 is where I'm going to read in just a moment. The 10th chapter of the book of Acts records for us the interaction with the apostle Peter and a man named Cornelius. Cornelius was a Roman centurion, a soldier. 
who lived in Caesarea. An angel from God told Cornelius to send for Peter. Peter came and preached to Cornelius, told him what he needed to know in order to be saved. In the conversation that Peter has with Cornelius, a, com a discussion comes up about Jesus. And Peter makes this statement regarding Jesus in Acts chapter 10, verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Now, there was a lot more in this conversation than just that, but I want to focus on that verse. Because Peter describes at least four qualities about Jesus that, that are amazing. First, that God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power. We don't usually think about Jesus being anointed with the Holy Spirit. We tend to think of that as the apostles uh, on the day of Pentecost and then later as uh, the apostles passed on that power to others. But Peter declares that Jesus was anointed. The second statement made regarding Jesus. Who went about doing good. I think there's an assumption that, that if we do what is good... That everything will work out in our lives. If we do what is good, then no one will be opposed to us. If we do what is good, then there won't be any problems that we have to deal with. And so it sometimes comes as a surprise when people find difficulties or have trouble in life. And they say, what did I do to deserve this? And their, their logic is, I've been living a good life. I shouldn't have to deal with this. Well, who could have ever lived a better life than Jesus did? He went about doing good. Not just doing good, but then the third statement Peter will make about him. And he was healing all of those who were afflicted by the devil. Whatever good works you're doing, probably there are a lot of people around you who have other problems. How many of those problems are you helping to solve? Jesus not only did what was good, but he was providing help for all of those who were around. He healed those with diseases. He comforted those who were broken hearted. He raised the dead to some who had lost family members. Surely this would have been a person that people would have loved. The fourth statement Peter makes is, and God was with him. Another assumption that often comes up in our lives when trouble strikes us is, well, God has abandoned me. This has happened to me, this is, this is troublesome, this is bothersome, or I have enemies, or I have conflicts. God has left me. God hasn't left you. Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit and with power. Jesus went about doing good. Jesus was healing all those who were afflicted by the devil. Jesus was in the comfort of God always. God was with him, and yet Jesus had enemies. Enemies that hated him enough that they would take his life, that they would oppose him regularly throughout his life. He'd broken no laws. He had harmed no one. He had committed no sin. There are several statements made in John chapter 15 regarding this as Jesus is talking to his disciples. I'm going to make reference to a couple. I'm not going to read either one of them. The 25th verse Jesus says, so this has fulfilled what was said by the prophets about me, that they have hated me without a cause. You see, there wasn't a reason for people to hate Jesus, but they hated him anyway. There was no purpose. He wasn't in opposition to them. But then he warned his disciples, and that warning should come down to us too, John 15, verse 18. If they hated me, they will hate you. That's a warning we probably don't want to hear. But it is one that should bring us comfort. When there are times that arise where people hate us, we should remember that they hated Jesus. Do we have enemies? Jesus had enemies. A second question we might ask ourselves, who were the enemies of the prophets? 
Jesus had enemies. Were there others in Scripture who also had trouble in life? Go with me to Matthew chapter 23. Let's start reading toward the end of this chapter. 23 is usually a chapter that we think of in terms of the harsh statements that Jesus made to those who are scribes and Pharisees. And certainly he does in Matthew chapter 23. But there's also another statement here that I'm interested in. A historical one. Begin reading in verse 29. Woe to you. Scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous and say, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Therefore, you are witnesses against yourself that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt, serpents, brood of vipers how can you escape the condemnation of hell therefore indeed i send you prophets wise men and scribes some of them you will kill and crucify and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth from the blood of righteous abel to the blood of zechariah son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Assuredly, I say to you, all things will come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. When Jesus looked at these people he saw them as a people who didn't want to receive the words of God that's what prophets do the prophets of old in the Old Testament carried the word of God to the people and that word was often a word of of condemnation it was often a word of judgment where the people were living immoral lives and God would call them to reckoning by the testimony of the prophets Jesus says concerning them, and it's specifically concerning Jerusalem, you killed the prophets. What prophets? Ahab was certainly evil. Who were the enemies of the prophets? Well, we could find several. One, I'll make reference in 1 Kings chapter 16. I'll give you a moment to turn there. I'll start reading in verse 25 in a moment. 1 Kings chapter 16 tells us about a family, a family of father and son who together make a terrible, evil pair. The first of the family members that I'm interested in, his name is Omri or Omri. His son is going to be Ahab and together they're going to make an evil duo. 1 Kings 16.25, Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord and did worse than all who were before him. For he walked in all the ways of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and in his sin by which he had made Israel sin, provoking the Lord of Israel to anger with their idols. Now the rest of the acts of Amri which he did, and the might that he showed, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? So Amri rested with his fathers and was buried in Samaria. Then Ahab, his son, reigned in his place. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, the son of Omri, became king over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel and Samaria 22 years. Now Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. And it came to pass as though it had not, as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took as wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians. And he went and served Baal and worshipped him. Then he set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a wooden image. And Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. This was not a good guy. 
Ahab, as he is described, is an evil man. He has come from an evil father, and that does not always carry. Many of the kings of Judah had evil fathers, but some of the sons were faithful to God. Not in the case of Ahab, king of Israel. Said concerning him that no one provoked God to anger greater than this man. There's a discussion that occurs. What would you expect God to say to this man? What should someone who is going to speak the word of God say to a man who is the most evil person who's described in the lineage of the kings of the Old Testament? What would you say to him? Well, you sure are a good king. God sure is proud of you. I like what you're doing. How could you say any of those things to an evil man of this sort? who had turned away the people uh, from worshiping after God, who had begun to worship idols, who had brought idol worship actually in among the people. 1 Kings chapter 22 tells us a story. We're not going to go and read it, but I want to refer to it. As the story unfolds, the king of Israel, Ahab, is wanting to go to war. He's wanting to take back some of his land that is now under the control of the Syrians, Ramoth Gilead. It's over in the land we would call Jordan today, across the Jordan River on the other side. And he consults with the king of Judah, Jehoshaphat, and says, will you go and fight with me? I need you to be a companion. Let's go fight together. And the king says, sure, I'll go and fight with you. My men will be as your men. My horses will be like your horses. He said, but first, let's inquire of God and see what God says about our venture. And so Ahab calls in all of his yes men prophets. And he called them in and says, should we go up and do this, this battle? And they all come in and says, yes, yes, go up. You'll be successful. You'll be great. Everything will work out wonderfully. Well, Jehoshaphat can spot yes men when he sees them. This man's a king. He's been around. He says, don't you have any other prophets? <laughs> you can almost hear it in his voice. Don't you have any real prophets around here? And Ahab answers truthfully. In 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 8, he said, yes, there's one more prophet. But I hate him because he never says anything good about me. And Jehoshaphat says, well, can we call him? So they call in Micaiah. And Micaiah has been warned by all the false prophets. You tell the king what he wants to hear. He wants to go up and do this battle and you don't say anything that will upset him. You say exactly what we said. We told him to go up. You tell him to go up too. And so Micaiah comes in. Ahab asks him. So what have you got to say, man of God? Should we go up or not? And Micaiah says, sure. Go up. Go fight. It'll all be well for you. And Ahab says, how many times should I make you swear to tell me the truth? Micaiah says, you want to know the truth? The truth is that God has already had a conversation and says, who is it's going to go and, and take Ahab into battle so that I can kill him? Ahab is going to be destroyed because of his evil works. How will I lead him into battle? And one of the spirits said, I will go and I will be in the mouths of the false prophets and I will lead Ahab into battle. And Micaiah says, you're not coming home. God has chosen for you to die. Ahab the evil king says, you put Micaiah in prison and you feed him bread and water until I come back. Micaiah says, if you ever come back, then I'm lying. Because the blood of your body will be licked by the dogs. All the fulfillment of that prophecy is going to come true in 1 Kings chapter 22. Why did Ahab hate Micaiah? His statement was, because you never said anything good about me. You know, there are lots of people who are like that. Sometimes people go to the scriptures and they say, you know, I don't like reading the Bible. Why not? Well, because the Bible's always telling me things I can't do. It says things about me that I 
that I don't like. Ahab was married to a woman named Jezebel. Jezebel was an evil woman. She was, first of all, not of the people. Uh, she didn't come from Israel, which was a commandment violation in and of itself. Secondly, she was the daughter of a, uh, an idol-worshipping king, the Sidonians. And she was an evil woman all her own right. She raised up the prophets of Baal. And in the discussions that will follow in, in 1 Kings chapter 17 and the battle that ensues at Mount Carmel and then in 1 Kings chapter 18 when Jezebel says to Elijah, I will kill you this day. Yes, the prophets had enemies. Question number three. Were there enemies of preachers in Scripture? Well, you know the answer to that. Let's take a look at uh, a man by the name of Herod and a fellow that you know as John the Baptist. Let's read a couple of verses from Matthew chapter 14. We don't have all of the details laid out in a strictly historical um, path here. The 10th verse of Matthew 14 says Herod had John beheaded while he was in prison. The backstory of that is John had been put in prison by Herod because John had spoken out regarding Herod being married to his brother Philip's wife. Herodias. Read verse 4. 3 and 4. Verse 3. For Herod had laid hold of John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because John had said to him, It is not lawful for you to have her. Why did John, the preacher, here have an enemy? Because he was telling for all practical purposes, the functional king of the land, that he was doing something that was immoral. And that functional king had the power of life and death in his hand. And so when the opportunity arose, then Herod took John's life. Why? Because he told Herod he was doing wrong, that he was sinning, that he was being immoral. There are some rather powerful and popular preachers on television today who are well known for their messages of what's described often as the health and wealth gospel. Their message is usually God wants you to be happy. God wants you to be healthy. God wants you to be rich. God wants you to enjoy life now. And thousands and thousands flock to them on a weekly basis for them to tell those people, God wants you to be happy. God wants you to be healthy. God wants you to have all the riches now. They are not saying the things that John the Baptist did. You're never going to hear Joel Osteen preach on marriage and divorce. It isn't going to happen. You're not going to hear him talking to the group that gathers to hear him that they're living in sin and that they need to repent and make a change in their lives. There are a lot of people who wouldn't want to preach on marriage and divorce in today's environment, at least not to say the things that Jesus did in Matthew chapter 19, verse 9. Herod was an enemy. Were there any enemies of the apostles? Well, as we look to the apostles, we find lots of enemies. As a matter of fact, the Jews were definitely enemies of the apostles. You want to see some? Start in Acts chapter 4. We'll start reading in the first verse. Now, as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid holds on them, laid hands on them, sorry, laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. Put them in custody. That's round one. 
Uh, they're going to have a conversation and they're going to tell them not to preach or teach any longer. Verse 7, when they'd set them in front of them, they said, By what power or name have you done this? And when he tells them, they, they see uh, Peter and John's boldness. But then down in verse 17, So that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this name. So they call them in, verse 18, and they tell them, Don't speak about Jesus anymore. That's round one. But the apostles don't quit. So they come back for round two. Let's read part of that in uh, chapter 5, verse 27. When they had brought them, they set them before the council. Same council. And the high priest asked them, saying, now verse 28, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. If something's about to fall on my head, you will tell me, right? <clears throat> I stopped in there somewhere. I'm not sure where yet. All right, into verse 28. Uh, and intend to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Keep reading. Drop down to verse 40. They agreed with him. We're leaving some stuff out. And when they called them, they called the apostles and beaten them. They commanded them that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Did they quit? No. Did they have enemies? Yes. What were those enemies doing? The enemies were telling them to hush. Don't preach in Jesus anymore. But the apostles kept preaching. And guess what happened? They kept being beaten. I feel like there's an arm reaching down to grab me. There were lots of people who hated Paul. We could thumb our way through the book of Acts. Acts chapter 13, we meet a guy by the name of Bar-Jesus, a sorcerer. And he's blocking Paul from being able to preach to a man by the name of Sergius Paulus. He hates Paul. A little farther on, we find ourselves in chapter 13. And, and now envious Jews are there in Antioch and they are opposing Paul and they don't want him preaching. A little farther we go along, chapter 14, and we find Paul in the city of Lystra. And now there are Jews from Iconium and Derbe, other cities nearby that have come to this, this town. And they cause such a riot that, that Paul is stoned and drug out of the city. They assume that he is dead. In Acts chapter 9, shortly before uh, or shortly after Paul is converted and he begins immediately to preach Jesus as Christ and the people living in that town decide they need to put Paul to death and so Paul has to flee from Damascus under the threat of death. He comes to Jerusalem and after he comes to Jerusalem he has to run from Jerusalem because they threaten to kill him there. Acts chapter 9 verse 23 we'll tell you about one of them. Verse 29 we'll tell you about the other. Acts 16, Paul's in Philippi, he's beaten and thrown in prison. What terrible thing has he done? He's healed a woman who had a spirit, an infirmity, and he's put in prison and beaten. Which brings you to another question. The one that's asked in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 16. Great question. Paul asks this and he says, Have I become your enemy? Because I tell you the truth. The work of preaching is to preach the word of God. Standing in a pulpit is not permission to voice your opinion on every topic that may come to mind. It is not free reign to decide to declare war on the known personal beliefs of some of the brethren and to publicly assault them. 
It does not give one the, the right to live life however you'd like to and, and uh, be free of accusation. Peter would say in 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 15, if any man suffer, let him suffer as a Christian, not as a murderer, not as a thief, not as an evildoer. If you suffer as a Christian, don't be ashamed. But the work of God comes with a charge that Paul would describe in 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in the first verse, going through, down through verse 5. He'd say, you're going to have to preach. And he was talking to Timothy, he said, you've got to preach the word when it's easy, when it's not. When people are willing to listen, when they're not willing to listen. That's your job. When you do that, you're going to make enemies. All it takes is just a little reading, and you find it happening. For example, Matthew chapter 19. Jesus makes a statement when asked a question about, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And Jesus has this response in Matthew 19, 4. He answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother? be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. What God has joined together, let not man separate. Jesus would say marriage is for life. He makes an enemy if you say that? Yeah, among some. The marriage should not have any uh, adultery. That there's no place in the lives of humanity for fornication. That God created us, male and female. That we are not the product of evolution. And you say those things in today's world and, and you can make enemies. I don't know if you've been keeping up with it. There's a battle going on on the internet right now about a, uh, how to describe a 17-year-old youth. He was born... I was going to call his name, but I'll leave it out. The, uh, the United Kingdom Telegraph had this lead story. U.S. teenager refused permission to change sex by Christian parents commits suicide. And then the story goes on and names him. Some of the stories I read of this week describe the circumstances in the letter that the, the young man wrote. And he describes his plight. His conservative religious parents, that's how the papers regarded him, or regarded them, would not consent to their son having a sex change op operation to make him a girl. So many of the papers describing whether it was him or her who was going to be buried and how he or she should be referred to and how the world should view that kind of a discussion. And that brings up a debate. And there are a lot of people who don't want to talk about that subject on both sides. And you can make enemies wading into that water. But the Bible addresses things regarding that. In fact, if anyone is in opposition to gay rights, you're going you're to create some enemies who are loud and, and prolific and often violent. Aggressive in their views will there be enemies of preachers yes will there be enemies of us could be one final thought if it's possible to be your enemy because someone tells you the truth what about if they don't tell you the truth what if they deprive you of truth I don't have time to read this morning from Acts chapter 20 in the conversation that Paul has with the elders from Ephesus. But when he talks to them, he says, I'm going away from you now, and I won't see you anymore. The Holy Spirit has told me that I will not see your face any longer. But he said, I am free of the blood of all men, because I have declared unto you all of the counsel of God. Paul says, I will not be held responsible for what you do or what you don't do because I've told you what God wanted you to hear. 
there's a conversation that takes place in Ezekiel chapter 3. And the prophet of God is told by God, I have made you Israel's watchman. And as the watchman, if I send you to the people and tell you to warn the people of the, of the harm that's coming their way, if you warn them, then you have done well. And if they are lost, it will be on their own heads because you told them. But then God says very sternly, but if I have told you to warn them and you do not warn them, I'll still hold them accountable for their sin. But he says to the prophet of God, I'll hold you responsible as well because you chose not to tell. You see, if we are going to serve God effectively, we not only have to tell the things that are true, but we are responsible to make sure that we don't withhold things that people don't want to hear. So, are people going to be angry with us? Perhaps. When people say that all you've got to do in order to be saved is just believe, and you preach what Jesus said in Luke chapter 13, verse 3, that you must repent. Or what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 and 33, that you must confess the name of Jesus before men in order for Jesus to confess you before the Father. Or what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, the gospel was to be sent to all the world and you would make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And when you have people who say, well, you don't have to do any of those things. Sometimes they get angry when you say this is what the Bible teaches. But if you withhold what the Bible teaches, aren't you really the enemy of humanity if you don't tell them what God says is true? So do we have enemies? Probably. Will we make enemies? Mm, probably. How should we respond to that? When people tell us, don't talk about those things anymore. We don't want to hear you say that. Then our response is going to have to be what the apostles did that we read a few moments ago. When they were called in and challenged by the, the uh, council uh, in Jerusalem in the first century, and they said, don't preach or teach in Jesus anymore. And they said, we must obey God rather than men. And that's where we serve. We must obey God rather than men. So the question that we'll end with, are you serving God effectively this morning? Are you part of the body of Christ? Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing blood? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? If so, it's because you have been obedient to the gospel's invitation. That you have come hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. That you have come believing the gospel of Jesus Christ. That you have repented of your sins and confessed the name of Jesus. And been, and been baptized for the remission of sins to be added to the kingdom of God. If that is not the case for you this morning... Why would you wait? In a moment, we'll sing the invitation song, and we urge you to come forward before this audience, make that confession, and be baptized even this morning and buried into Christ. If you're a child of God but not faithful, the invitation is for you. If we can assist you spiritually, come as we stand and sing. Jesus is calling.
closing song this morning number three we'll do the first second and the last stanzas of this hope you can come back tonight and visit with us and um, worship with us again if you're visiting uh, come back at five we'll have another assembly and uh, again if we can serve you let us know and uh, we'll have our closing prayer after these stanzas <clears throat> uh, George D. King, Father, we are thankful for this first day of the week you have blessed us with, for this another opportunity to gather with our brothers and sisters to worship you in spirit and truth. We are thankful for every opportunity we have to gather in feather, to gather together in fellowship. We pray that you will bless this church and will continue to work in fellowship together in harmony throughout this coming year. Father, we're mindful of those that have uh, may be grieving because of the loss of loved ones and those who are dealing with sickness at this time. We pray your blessing on them, that you provide for comfort and for their needs. Father, we ask you to now to go with us as we depart. We ask you to watch over and protect us until we meet again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> 